and I'm going to start it now. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for our uh, for attending our second weekly Q and A or informal webinar with the entire um, ALS patient community about the Healy ALS platform trial. My name is Sabrina Paganoni, and I'm so excited to be here today with our patient navigators, Catherine Small and Alison Pogge-Miller. Uh, the trial is um, a collaboration of the entire ALS community. So for today, I, I only have a brief uh, slide deck that I want to go over with you, but then I really want to use most of the time to answer your questions. So feel free to ask any questions you might have. You can type them in the question box um, on your Zoom. Next slide. So we'll first briefly review why we are so excited about the Healy ALS platform trial. And as, it, as is now tradition for these weekly webinars, we're gonna share updates on enrollment and sites. Uh, I, want, um, I would like to introduce the patient navigators and let them um, introduce themselves actually so that you can uh, put a face to a name and, and, and see who will um, answer your questions and, and be uh, really a valuable resource for all of you who may have questions outside of, of these webinars. Uh, I'll provide some more um, website links and, and, and suggestions on how to stay in touch, but most, most of all, um, we would like to answer your questions. Next slide. I always want to start by saying that we are excited about the Healy ALS platform trial because it is an innovative trial approach. Uh, the only reason we're doing this is to accelerate the time it takes to find new effective treatments. And we know that we can cut down the time by over 50% based on experience in cancer and other fields of medicine. That's why we want to do this because we want to uh, find new treatments for people with ALS as, as quickly as possible. Next slide. The way we're gonna do this is to test multiple treatments at the same time and to continue to add more treatments to be tested using the same infrastructure. This is a, a radical change from traditional clinical trials where we can only test one treatment at the time, at the time and, and we use a dedicated infrastructure that then gets dismantled and can never be used again uh, to test other drugs. So here we're doing something very different. We built a, an optimized infrastructure we're starting to uh, test three different drugs, and then we will continue to add more and continue to test and use the same infrastructure so that we can really accelerate the entire um, field. Next slide. The first three uh, drugs that we're testing are listed on the slide. They're tested as regimens. Each regimen uh, will uh, test the different drugs. So regimen A is testing, say, leucoplan, regimen B, is for the deeper start and regimen C is for CNM A8. Uh, we're about to add regimen D uh, that will test predopinely. Predopinely, it's, it's a different drug and we are also working on adding more treatments in 2021. Uh, all these treatments were selected by an expert committee of ALS scientists and experts based on a competitive process. We continue to accept nominations because as new drugs are discovered, we want to be able to add them to the platform um, so that there's really a, a minimal lag between discovery and testing. And, and this is part of the overarching goal of accelerating the timelines. Next slide. So, and this is, I think, the, uh, the most exciting news for us is that enrollment continues to uh, make great progress. As of uh, today, uh, 127 individuals with ALS signed informed consent and 74 of them are on study drug. We will continue to update the uh, ALS community on our enrollment. As you may remember, for, if you attended last week, we really got the idea uh, of, um, of posting enrollment updates on a weekly basis from the patient community. It was Sandy Morris and her colleagues at IAM ALS, as well as other people who participate uh, in our patient advisory committee. They really um, suggested that we do that and we're happy to do that and to provide updates so that you can see the progress that we're making in the trial. Um, and, and, and again, because we're going to continue to add drugs, uh, we, we, want, we will continue to have spots. So really, this is a large-scale trial uh, that will um, enroll many, many people with ALS and will continue to test many, many drugs until we find effective treatments. Next slide. 
this is a list of the enrolling sites as of today. We have 25 of them. Um, I underlined Wake Forest, which is the one that was uh, activated most recently this week. So this is um, in addition to the ones that um, uh, we shared last week. Next slide. And now I want to uh, introduce or actually ask Catherine and Alison to introduce themselves, tell us more about um, why they care about ALS, why they're working in this field, and tell us more about their role as patient navigators. So I should uh, add that they, they both just started working with us on the platform trial, and really what we want to do is to have a central people that can connect with patients with ALS uh, and then be available by both email and phone. The information is on the slide so that you can um, have a point of contact for any questions you might have. Katrin? Sure. Hi, I'm Catherine Small. So um, as Dr. Paganoni was saying, I'm the patient navigator recently hired for the platform trial. Um, I have a background in neuroscience and psychology, so I'm just very excited to be contributing to, to this research project. And um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to, to be filling a role where I bridge communication between the ALS community and, and the researchers running this, this study. Thank you. Alison? Thank you. Um, my name is Allison, and I'm so excited to be a part of the Healy Platform Trial team. I lost my husband to ALS in 2016 and have since dedicated my time and energy 100% to our community. I went back to school and completed my graduate studies in clinical research management at the end of last year, and I'm really excited to take that education and my experience on the journey of ALS and combine it with my past experience of technology and strategic planning and process development to really ensure that every patient and every family that participates in this trial has an exceptional experience. Um, I also do serve in a couple of other roles. For Niels, I am the co-chair of the Patient Education and Advocacy Committee that oversees the Clinical Research Learning Institute and the Research Ambassador Training Program. And I work in collaboration with the CREATE Consortium and ALS Untangled to create podcasts where people, well, we can bring questions to the table and talk about alternative therapies and the scientific value of those. And I serve as a member of the board of directors for my local Arizona chapter of ALSA. So I'm very excited to be a part of this and look forward to contributing in this role to this, to this community as a whole. Thank you. Thank you both. And, and I just want to say that we are, uh, we're facing this uh, new problem in ALS, which is a good problem to have in the sense that uh, we have many sites um, available. Uh, we have lots of new drugs to be tested uh, and lots of interest from the patient community. Now, what we want to do is to optimize the system so that we can uh, find uh, a screening spot for all the people who want to, to enroll. We understand that right now, at this time, there's more interest uh, for, from patients that, uh, you know, and it's taking a little bit of time for sites to get activated and for people to, to find a screening spot. But that's exactly one of the reasons why we brought Catherine and Alison on to help optimize the system. And so we're certainly um, working on that. I know we, it's not going to be an overnight solution, but we certainly understand the need to uh, make the process as efficient as possible. Next slide. So at this time, uh, we have 25 sites that are actively enrolling. Uh, as you may remember from previous presentations, we selected a total of 54 sites uh, to be um, part of the trial at this time. Uh, so we are working actively on activation of the remainder uh, of the sites that have not been activated yet. I also want to mention that in November, we will issue um, a new call for sites so that in addition to the 54, we will add more uh, to cover certain geographies or areas of the country that are, um, you know, have more, uh, more requests. So we want to increase capacity. Uh, you can go on our uh, website to uh, find the list of uh, trial sites. Uh, and there is not only the contact information of the site, but also um, uh, there is uh, an asterisk to indicate if the site is enrolling or not. Uh, and since we are on that topic, I see a couple of questions um, about this that have come in in the chat uh, about specific sites. So one site is, uh, one question is whether uh, the University of California uh, at Irvine will start uh, uh, 
uh, enrolling. Uh, so I don't have an exact timeline for that, but certainly we're working very closely uh, with that particular site that, that has a lot of research experience uh, to be able to activate them very soon. So our goal is to activate all 54 uh, certainly by the end of the year uh, or sooner, uh, you know, again, we are working uh, with all of them closely on all the activation tasks, and then we will add more um, in addition to the 54. Another question that is about this topic that came in is, why is it taking so long to get some sites going? So I would say that there are several reasons for that. So in addition, in order for a site uh, to be activated or, or basically to be given permission to um, Enrolls, uh, enroll participants in the trial, several steps need to happen that involve different parts of each hospital or academic center. Uh, and and that, that's for compliance, for safety, uh, for regulations, for, for contracts, uh, to be able to make sure that, we need to make sure that um, every site has all the pieces in place uh, that allow them to enroll uh, the participants and have them um, uh, have a great trial experience. And there's a lot of administrative um, um, steps that need to be completed. I would say that COVID-19 did have a huge impact on this, not just because uh, perhaps some clinics have been closed during the lockdown, but because the entire research process slow down and we're still recovering uh, from that. Uh, I think we're not back to normal uh, by any means. We're definitely getting there. And I think it's actually remarkable that in the midst of the pandemic, we do have sites that were able to be activated in July and that we do have enrollment that quite frankly is better than the enrollment of, I would say the vast majority uh, of previous ALS trials. So I think we're in, in a way, while this is not perfect, uh, we're certainly uh, doing, uh, I think, you know, uh, everything that can be done given the circumstances. Uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel in the sense that the pandemic, you know, obviously uh, now people are, the processes, the research processes, uh, all the uh, contracts and administrative processes are restarting. So I hope that we'll be able to catch up very soon, but that's why uh, there's, the geographic variability and different sites have been impacted in many different ways, not just access of the patients to the site, but also a lot of the research um, processes that have been impacted in the background. That's not visible on the outside, but definitely that has happened and slowed down things. Um, and then another question about sort of uh, other sites. So when will Columbia start? Uh, I was told this week, so uh, that's the question. Uh, so I, I know that they are completing the very last steps. Again, um, this is, you know, uh, something that we're working on very closely and, and we rely on sites and all their uh, different contracts, offices, different parts of the office and research group to provide all the necessary documentation. Uh, so as soon as that's provided, we can activate them. Um, the other question is uh, about um, enrollment. So the, the question is for the new sites, are, are they expected to begin enrollment at the current rate of one to two a week? I see that question in the chat. So, so I think that absolutely we, um, the good news with the platform trial is that we have lots of spots available. So there's no cap per site. So certainly uh, any site can, um, uh, can enroll as many people uh, as they can feasibly, um, you know, enroll uh, at a particular site. Now, historically, as I think the, the person who asked uh, might know, uh, historically, the rate of enrollment has been um, actually uh, slower than that. Historically, for ALS trials, uh, each site might enroll one patient a month or so. But now, because here we have this platform concept with a lot of synergies and efficiencies, we certainly hope that each site will enroll uh, much faster than that. For example, one participant a week or so. Uh, that would be, uh, I think, something that, that would be a, a good change uh, for the field. And certainly we want to start there and, and keep doing better. So I think that's, um, that's kind of the, um, what we're looking at in terms of, um, of rate of enrollment. Uh, obviously that means that some sites will have to hire um, new, new coordinators, new staff to be able to increase capacity. Uh, I can share that we're doing that uh, at MGH as well. So we are hiring uh, and, and obviously um, it takes some time to hire and train the best people because we also want people to uh, be well-trained and be the right fit for these uh, trials so that we can give participants a good trial experience. Uh, we're totally hiring to increase capacity. And so again, we're working in that direction to increase the enrollment rate, even at our site. 
um, and then uh, and then the question I, I see um, uh, the uh, you're typing as as I speak. So you said if demand is so high, this still seems so slow. And and I would agree with you. I mean that's this is certainly not uh, perfect because we would want to meet demand more um, you know uh, in a better way. But I think that we are starting something very new. We are at the beginning of something very new. Well, with the platform trial concept, we are basically disrupting the pace of research and it takes some time for all the sites and all the clinics to adapt to that. So I think this is the first step in the right direction. And, and the reason we're doing these weekly webinars, we brought Catherine and Alison um, uh, on board, et cetera, is to exactly start to, to think big in terms of enrollment rates and, and, and say, okay, we, we have some historical averages. We don't like that. We want to do better. And so I think this is the beginning. Uh, next slide. And I just want to share this um, link also for, um, for people to sign up to, uh, to our newsletter, so for, for our newsletter so that we, we can continue to send information also by email. I see other um, uh, messages that, and other questions that are um, coming, uh, coming up again on the site availability um, uh, about the um, site availability for expanded access. That's another topic that's coming up in the chat. So the questions about the expanded access are where can I pre-enroll for expanded access? That's one question. The other question is when expanded access is available, will it be available uh, for trial locations that are on the west coast? So just want to spend a minute to talk about expanded access. So uh, expanded access, as, as you know, is something um, relatively new for the uh, field of ALS. We started doing expanded access programs, small, small programs at MGH uh, in 2018. Uh, and we are certainly looking um, to uh, expand. Uh, we are actively fundraising for that. Uh, we are planning to start uh, more EAPs in early 2021. Uh, and that's not going to be only at MGH. We want to include other sites in parallel to the platform trial. In other words, we want to expand the expanded access, uh, you know, to other locations. Uh, uh, and so there's going to be a few uh, other uh, platform trial sites that will be part of it, uh, you know, uh, depending on availability of resources and interest from the sites. So uh, I, I don't know exactly which sites will be part of that yet. Uh, I would certainly hope that there's gonna be geographic you know, spread of these so that it's not only the East Coast, but it's perhaps also the Midwest, the South, the, the West Coast. So certainly uh, we want to expand in that direction as well. Um, and then uh, in terms of, uh, can you pre-enroll? Well, I would say that um, in general for both the platform trial and expanded access programs when they are available and where they will be available, the enrollment is actually uh, managed at the site level. And this is because uh, we cannot manage site operations. In other words, we can have central resources like Catherine and Alison who are starting now to work with the sites and create efficiencies and try to uh, match patients with the right site as well as uh, really explore all opportunities to make sure that enrollment can, uh, can be made more efficient. At the same time, we cannot substitute for local operations because uh, you still need to book a point, you know, every participant will need to book appointments to be seen at the time that the entire research team is available um, or, the, or the people that are needed for that particular visit are available at that site. So uh, any type, you know, everything that goes in terms of scheduling actual visits uh, or the process of being considered at a specific site uh, need, still needs to be managed primarily by the site because they, they know their own capability, they know their own um, sort of uh, availability of staff uh, and, and hopefully they will have to continue to hire because there's more demand and so as as sites see more demand, they, they can also hire and, and scale up their own operations. So that, that's the hope. So I would encourage you to still be in contact with um, your site, with your coordinator, with your uh, physician uh, at the ALS clinic, uh, because they, they, they are the ones who can really tell you more about their local operations. Uh, and another question, since some sites started in July, uh, they should be finished with the first six months in, in January 2021. Uh, and, and that's correct. Uh, so, you, you, so some people, the first people who started the trial started participating in July 2021. 
that means that the six month placebo controlled trial will end for, the, for those participants in January 2021. And as you may remember from previous presentations, those participants who complete the placebo controlled trial will become eligible to enter the open label extension, which means they will be able to continue to stay on active drug um, for several months uh, after the completion of the placebo control trial. So the question in the chat is, would we have some early feedback on the initial results of the first drugs then in January 2021? No, that, unfortunately that's not possible by design. So the way the, the trial, this trial and any trial really works, is that you need to analyze the results after the last patient completes the uh, last visit. So essentially, uh, we need to enroll all participants, allow them the follow up for six, month, six months, so not just for the first few people, but for all the people who are participating in that particular regimen for that particular drug. And then we can analyze the results as a group. Now, you may remember from some um, previous presentations that we also did build in some uh, interim analysis to be able to tell early if a drug is certainly effective or certainly not effective. But those interim analysis, so that those sort of uh, preliminary looks um, are not the complete result of the trial. So in order to have the final result, um, uh, we, we need to uh, wait until the end of, of follow-up for all participants. Now, if um, obviously if, if those, you know, those interim looks are also designed to stop drugs that are clearly harmful, but uh, the bar is set in a way that we're not just going to stop all the drugs, right? I mean, it, it's only if, if you really uh, find a signal that's really particularly detrimental that you would stop the drug. If not, we still need to see the completion of the trial to get um, to the final results. Um, questions about, um, or also, um, so, when, when, so the question I guess in follow-up is, so when, when will you know uh, essentially uh, the, the results of the first set of drugs? So essentially we started testing three drugs, as, as I just mentioned, in July of 2021. So the first participants will end their six month participation in January, but then we need to see, you know, and, and wait until the end uh, of uh, the follow-up for all participants for those three drugs. Uh, and so obviously the time it's gonna take uh, will depend on the enrollment rate. In other words, if we enroll everyone very fast, obviously, everyone will come in um, kind of as, as a group and then we'll have the results sooner. Instead, if the enrollment is slower, then it will take more time to accumulate participants and then to see the final results. Now, at the enrollment rates that we are seeing now, uh, we are optimistic uh, that uh, if these enrollment rates continue or even maybe they improve as we open new sites and, and actually add more sites, uh, we're hopeful that we will be able to um, enroll everyone so that we will have results um, you know, uh, in, in a timely manner. Having said that, I think it's too early to tell the exact time because it will depend on the final enrollment rates. Uh, but essentially, you know, we can, you know, that's the purpose of doing these weekly webinars. That's why we keep updating you on the enrollment rates. And so rather than me guessing, we can, you know, let's just be in touch over the next few weeks and see how the enrollment rate uh, shapes up. And then uh, depending on that, when we get a little bit closer, I think we can make uh, more accurate predictions. Another question about, so if you, for the, the site, site availability again, uh, if you start the one site uh, and then a different site becomes um, online, comes online, that uh, can you make the change? So for the placebo controlled trial, so for the first six months of the trial, when people are assigned to either active drug or placebo, for those first six months, we ask participants to stay at the one site that they start with. Uh, it's particularly problematic from um, really an operational perspective to have people change sites during the placebo control portion. And this is because the way the system works, the drug supply works, because everything is blinded and, and nobody knows what the participant is taking. It's particularly problematic to have those kits, the, the active versus placebo drug kits be rerouted to a different center and kind of restart the, uh, the trial uh, for that particular participant at a different center. So uh, we need to ask you to stay at the site for the first six months. Now, 
for the open label extension after that, because everyone is on drug, uh, that complication is not there. Uh, so we can talk about changing sites after, afterwards for the open label extension, but uh, not for the placebo control trial. Um, and then um, they say, uh, so there's a couple of questions about enrollment at the site. So one, one question is, how is it determined who's, uh, who's enrolled first at each site? And also sort of a follow-up question from the same person. I've been told from certain sites that there is a long list and that they would only enroll their current patients first. At what point do they consider enrolling outside patients? So it's a series of questions about essentially the same topic. So, so first of all, uh, I, I recognize that that's, um, that's not the ideal situation because ideally we would be happy, we would be more than happy to be able to uh, meet demand in real time so that everyone who wants to enroll can be enrolled at that time. However, uh, given dif different, uh, re because of different reasons, and I have to say also because of the pandemic, I think we, we cannot meet that demand at this time. However, I can assure that we're trying to do, we're working with the sites to scale up uh, operations so that we can meet that demand. Having said that, each site is responsible for managing their own enrollment process. So, uh, so basically, we, we cannot micromanage that, again, because they know exactly staff availability, how many coordinators they have, how many people they can feasibly and safely enroll to ensure a good clinical trial experience for those enrolled at that site, given the availability of resources. So it is true that as a consequence, some sites might have a longer list than others. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we brought Catherine and Alison uh, on board to sort of start mapping that so that we can hopefully create opportunities, um, you know, to see uh, how we can maximize enrollment at all sites. Um, so different um, sites use different criteria uh, and, uh, and so they could, different sites might choose to uh, get more local patients because they're concerned about travel because of the pandemic or not. Again, we don't dictate that. It depends on the site. So again, speak with your local doctor uh, to discuss how they determine that. Um, I can tell you at our site, we take both clinic patients and outside patients. So uh, that's possible. Uh, obviously, um, we do have people who have been um, kind of uh, uh, asking us uh, for this for a long time. We do have a long list as well. And that's why we're hiring new coordinators to be able to increase enrollment rates. Um, so th there's a few questions about uh, sort of the different drugs. So uh, one person asked, you know, if you had to choose which drug um, uh, would you want to be on? I'm, I'm trying to get the right question here. Sorry, I lost. There's so many questions um, that uh, uh, I want to make sure I get. Yes, one person asked, if you had ALS, what regimen would you want to be on? Uh, and then I think another um, other question is also related about drug choice. So for the open label extension, the question is, are you able to take the drug, uh, only the drug from the regimen in which you participated or can you get access to any of the three drugs? So I want to explain a little bit want to take these two questions sort of as a whole and explain a little bit the concept of drug choice uh, and, and kind of how that's determined. So for the placebo control trial, uh, the, the drugs that we are putting in the trial are drugs that all have the same equal promise uh, based on thorough review uh, by a committee of ALS, ALS experts and scientists. So they, they reviewed all the basic science data, the preclinical data, the lab data, previous, previous experience in human trials, and there's really no reason to believe that one or the other might be better. Uh, and so that's why we're testing them. That's the ethical basis of uh, doing clinical trials in general, and specifically in a platform trial, where we have drugs that are all equally promising or equally likely to have an effect uh, and for, for that reason, uh, we, we are, we're testing all of them essentially at the same time. And then again, we're gonna add more as more are discovered. But at this time, they're all equally promising. We do have a video on our website that explains the concept. So if you're interested, please go on our website. There's a nice video that explains that. And this is really a key concept that really truly, I wouldn't know which one is best uh, for anyone really, because at this time, the available evidence is equal for all of them. And this has been vetted by a committee of experts. Now, in terms of what happens to each participant when, you know, after they are assigned to a regimen or a drug, 
uh, what happens to them when they go into the open label extension? Can they choose a different drug or would they have um, access only to that drug to which they were originally assigned? So the answer to that is that uh, the particular participant will only have access to the active drug of the regimen they were in. And this is because both the placebo control trial and the open label extension are one trial. Only that at the beginning, for the first six months, there is a placebo component and then everyone gets drug after six months. This is very important because the open label extension is not just an add-on, but it is part of the trial and provides critical information about long-term safety. As you may have heard from previous presentations we discussed with the FDA, that if this trial was successful for any of the regimens, if there's very convincing evidence of positive results, this drug could serve to register a new drug. This, this trial could serve to register a new drug. So in, in other words, the results of this trial will have important implications for the entire ALS community. And because of that, it's important to obtain long-term safety data. And that's what the open label extension also provides, that we have long-term exposure to make sure that the drug is not only effective, but also safe when given long-term in sort of a relatively large number of individuals. So that's why the open label extension is actually part of the trial. And so that's why we need to follow people um, long-term and that's accomplished by um, uh, giving people um, access to active treatment long-term within that regimen, uh, within the regimen they were assigned. To. Now, keep in mind that if somebody, um, for whatever reason, doesn't want to go into the open label extension, if they're still eligible for the trial, they can go back and be reassigned to any of the other regimens. So uh, that will be a possibility, but people will still have to be um, uh, eligible for that. Um, and then another question about the open label extension, can someone who is not part of the trial participate in the open label extension? And the answer to that is no, because again, for the reason that I just described, the open label extension is actually part of the trial, is an important component of the trial where we obtain different information from the initial placebo control trial, but nevertheless, very important information. And that's long-term safety data as well as long-term efficacy data. Um, and then another question about, again, uh, drug choice um, uh, and kind of the consequence of that. So first of all, uh, one question is, is there any potential difference for limb onset versus bulbar onset and the drug that should be on? Uh, and the answer, no. So again, the, the drugs are equally promising for people with ALS in general. So the, there isn't a preference or predilection for uh, limb or bulbar in any way. So, so again, regardless of the onset, I think uh, all three are, are equally promising. Um, and then the question is, what is the plan to get any drug to FDA for approval if there are some positive results? Uh, so absolutely. So every drug will then be considered as an individual drug um, compared to placebo. We will take the totality of the evidence, which means the placebo control trial, as well as the open label uh, extension for that particular regimen, and present that to the FDA. And so depending on the results, obviously um, th those could be negative or positive. If they are extremely positive, uh, it could be um, you know, the basis of the registration of a new drug. Um, I think I answered all the questions that are online now. I do want to mention that we received a couple of questions uh, before the webinar. I want to read those as well. There's a question about remote options, remote visits. Uh, so for both so the, so the regular trial and, and also uh, expanded access options uh, when they become available. And the question is whether there will be remote visit options, especially if COVID um, remain an issue. So for both, the uh, platform trial itself, uh, the open label extension, but also the expanded access options that we are um, working towards um, and we want to start them in 2021. Uh, so the, the, the re there are options for remote visits if needed because of the pandemic. In other words, uh, if there is a, um, depending on the geographic area, obviously we are present uh, in different regions, but depending on that geographic area, if the pandemic is a concern at the time that the visit is scheduled, in order to protect the safety of the participant and to make the trial visit feasible, some visits might be turned uh, virtual, may, may, may happen in telemedicine or by phone. 
Now, the specifics of which visits and, and what's, what's, what's done at each visit, et cetera, will depend on both the center, the region where you are, and the impact of COVID, as well as um, the, the specific visit uh, or, or where you are in the trial and whether it's the um, placebo control trial or the expanded access option. So we all want to make this feasible and safe for everyone involved. Uh, I would say that in-person visits allow us to collect important information such as biomarkers that we all know are very important uh, to help understand the activity of the drug. So they're not, it's not, um, you know, it's not sort of a, um, a secondary issue there, right? So we're collecting, seeing people in person allows us to do more testing uh, and collect the entire set of safety uh, and efficacy measures, as well as important biomarker measures that are very important for us to be able to fully um, understand if the drug is uh, safe and effective. So those in-person visits do remain the preferred option and are very important. However, again, because of the pandemic, we understand that, uh, that we needed to add flexibility and we did. And so for that reason, some visits can be done remotely. And again, another question about the expanded access program. Um, it was asked, you know, uh, which sites will participate. Uh, and so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the idea is to uh, do these expanded access programs um, at different sites. Again, it's not gonna happen overnight. We're still fundraising for it. We're still setting them up, but the plan is to extend the expanded access options to uh, different sites that are part of the platform, MGH being one of them. Uh, for the first few EAP programs, uh, we have had great discussions with some sites, including Northwestern and Duke. So I expect that they are interested in, in, in hopefully that will be part uh, of these. Uh, I believe they will. Uh, and there, there's many more sites that are interested. So again, it's, uh, it's all something that we're, we're really working on um, uh, very actively. Another question um, is about sporadic versus familial ALS. Uh, if any drug tests better for familial compared to sporadic. So for, for this particular trial at this time, uh, in October 2020, the drugs that are in the trial um, are, are, are not targeted to familial ALS specifically. We believe that they are applicable to both familial and sporadic, and there's no specific difference in terms of which ones for familial or which ones for sporadic. Now, obviously, as you know, there are also very exciting, very exciting um, trials that are going on, um, not part of the platform trial, but um, in general, there are trials that are targeted to specific um, forms of the disease, such as people who carry the SOD1 gene or the C9 gene, or um, the uh, FAST gene, uh, so those are available publicly. You can you know, look them up on clinicaltrials.gov or on the news website, and those, um, those trials are targeting uh, specific forms of the disease. For this particular trial at this time, um, we are, we're basically accepting all sporadic and familial cases. So there's a few other questions. Uh, if someone has a, a negative reaction to a drug, can they drop out of the drug and reapply for a different drug? So, uh, so, so yes, if somebody, um, you know, for, for whatever reason cannot complete a regimen, let's say that you are assigned to a regimen, to one regimen, and you cannot complete the 24 weeks, uh, there is the possibility of restarting from the beginning. However, somebody will still have to qualify. So in other words, you will have to go back and, and redo the screening. Uh, and if, if someone still qualifies, they can be assigned uh, to the other drugs, to any of the other drugs. Now, in terms of the timing, uh, we cannot allow people to restart more frequently than every six months. So in other words, uh, people can either complete the six month trial and then go back or interrupt, but then they would have to wait until sort of the initial predicted six months would have uh, passed and then reapply. Uh, other questions. Um, the, uh, the question is about AMX35. Uh, and, and there is a question about uh, the drugs, whether they are available to purchase and, and, and why can't we get the dosages and protocol. Actually, everything is publicly available. So you can look it up online. Uh, there is the full text of the paper. Uh, please send an email to the patient navigator uh, and we can share the uh, information. Everything is publicly available. Um, Next question, wouldn't it make, make sense to enroll people with lower uh, ALS FRSR scores first? First provided that they have good breathing score and are they enrolling people who are on bands? 
So, um, so I think these, there's several questions uh, sort of embedded in this question. So um, the, the, the inclusion exclusion criteria for the trial are publicly available uh, and you can see the link on our website as well as you can look at clinicaltrials.gov. And so uh, there is a cutoff for respiratory function uh, and that's 50%. There is no cutoff for ALS FRSR uh, function. So we know that those um, scores on the ALS FRSR obviously are very variable and uh, highly dependent on um, where the disease presents and the rate of progression. Uh, so we don't limit uh, participation by ALS FRSR score nor do we give a sort of a preference to, to people with high scores or low scores. Uh, so again, the, the inclusion exclusion criteria are based on time since onset, as well as vital capacity, as well as other criteria that are publicly available um, on the website and on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, in terms of people using ventilators, again, there's no specific um, restriction, as you can see um, on the public uh, website on use of ventilators, but people need to still have a 50% um, vital capacity. Uh, and so most people who have a vital capacity of at least 50% are not on ventilators. Um, so, so that's kind of um, the way the, the, the trial, um, the, the criteria are, are written. So I think we are, um, we answer the questions that are on the chat, we answered 23 questions, I believe, plus two before 25. Last week we answered 52. So I'm glad that we can continue to answer many questions um, over the course of these uh, webinars. Um, and so I think that we can conclude the event. And I just wanted to thank you for um, uh, all your attention and all the excellent questions. Um, and then actually there is a late breaking <laughs> question that just came in, uh, not a question, but a comment. It would be great if the breeding score requirement was removed. It seems to be arbitrary and punitive. So I, I, I do want to address this uh, because I think it's an important point and, and something that we, we need to discuss um, sort of um, as a community. So the, the, all the inclusion exclusion criteria, including the breeding requirement, the vital capacity requirement, as well as all the other criteria, were selected uh, after a lot of work that was done by a large group of people, including statisticians, investigators, with input from a large patient advisory committee. Now, the reason for selecting those uh, criteria is to allow us to have a statistical design that's robust and statistical power that's high enough so that we can tell at the end of the trial whether the drug works or not. And this is a balance between allowing access but also allowing the, the statistics to work so that we can answer the scientific question. Now, as you know from previous trials, once the trial provides results, then the medication might be applicable or, or available if, it, if it's positive to everyone, not just to people who only qualified for the trial. However, it's very important that we do the trials and we design them in a way that's efficient and gives us the best shot at uh, getting an answer. When we extend the criteria to include, let's say, uh, everyone, for example, or, or people who have all variable uh, sort of um, um, metrics to start with, what happens is that we have less statistical power because there's a lot of variability in the population. As you know, people with ALS can be very different from one another. And so if we extend participation uh, to all or to the majority of people, then we wouldn't have enough statistical powers to answer the scientific question. Now, we also do understand that people who don't qualify want to have access to experimental treatments, and that's exactly why we're setting up um, expanded access programs to also allow for that. Uh, so I think that that was the follow-up um, question, you know, so what happens if, if you have a vital capacity less than 50 percent? That's why we are setting up uh, expanded access uh, programs. Um, and another question about uh, someone with a PEG, would they qualify um, uh, if, if, the, if the drug can be delivered via feeding tube? Actually, that depends on the drug. Not all drugs can be given by feeding tube. It depends on the formulation. Even drugs that are normally taken by mouth, some of them can be given in the feeding tube and some cannot. So, uh, so that's why, um, you know, I guess the, the requirement for being able to swallow is there. 
Um, there is a question about are the Q&A from last week available online? So we are working towards posting them. We're uh, getting all the necessary permits to be able to post that. Okay. And then the, the last question is how long it, does it take to get a response uh, from a site? So as I said earlier, um, it, it depends on the local site uh, and, and that's why we're working on the sites to, uh, to help them um, you know, respond to uh, participants as, as quickly as possible. But we understand uh, the fact that there is high demand um, and so there's limited uh, bandwidth at the moment but we're working towards increasing that. So again, I think I, now we are at 30 questions. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, and um, and we, uh, again, we look forward to uh, touching base again with you next week um, and, and feel free to come back with, uh, with questions. And thank you, Catherine and Alison and, and everyone, please feel free to call them uh, or email them um, for additional questions. Thank you so much. <laughs>